<laughs> it was stressful, uh, but good times. Okay, so uh, just to put everyone on the, on the same page, um, we are very interested in, in these strongly interacting uh, systems um, that we usually have a hard time reaching. For example, these neutron stars are very far away. We have to build LIGO <laughs> to, see, to see well in black hole that. Uh, the, the first thing that we, that we saw, maybe we'll see neutron stars in, in the, the gravitational wave uh, emission uh, at some point. But clearly they're far away, not so practical to get there. Uh, yet they're wonderful objects because they're um, uh, prohibited from further uh, shrinking just by Pauli pressure, balancing out the gravitational attraction. Um, uh, we find, of course, the fermions in, in, inside nuclei, where we have strongly interacting protons and neutrons. Uh, another example on the slide are high TC superconductors, notoriously difficult to understand because these electrons are very strongly interacting. And so we love our ultra cold gases to sort of uh, provide a, a link between these uh, very different systems at very different densities um, uh, because we can realize very simple um, fundamental models of uh, fermionic, uh, uh, strongly directing Fermi systems in, in our vacuum chambers at density a million times thinner than air, uh, but connecting to the physics, for example, of these uh, neutron stars. Um, now, what, what do I actually mean by strong interactions? Uh, well, uh, there are two parameters that you're uh, interested in. Uh, there's the interparticle spacing, d, or the density to the minus one third, and there is uh, the scattering length, which tells you essentially the size of these little uh, uh, atoms, or at least how, how, how much of the other atom a given atom sees. So now, as depicted, if the scattering length is much smaller than the interparticle uh, spacing, this is a weakly directing gas. They rarely collide, and uh, we have a very long mean free path accordingly. But of course, in such a situation where I've blown up the scattering length, uh, to on the order of these particle spacing, then they collide, these atoms collide at every encounter. It's a very strongly interacting gas. And of course, as you know, in quantum mechanics, the scattering length even diverges, changes sign, and all these magical things, which we can actually do using a Feshbach resonance. So this cartoon picture should not necessarily stick uh, uh, too uh, strongly in, in your minds. It turns out when you go to very low temperatures, there's another length scale that comes in, the De Broglie wavelength. And of course, uh, quantum statistics starts playing a role once the De Broglie wavelength becomes on the order of the interparticle spacing. So when all these three length scales become of the same order, the scattering length, the De Broglie wavelength, the interparticle spacing, then interesting states of matter emerge that we actually have a hard time understanding uh, theoretically. The various uh, questions that we always are interested in, what happens when, when I go to zero temperature, what, what happens in that limit, is there something interesting? Is the ground state of such a gas um, uh, stable? And at some point, usually our gases would like to form a solid. But is there some interesting uh, state um, in principle that one could find at low temperatures? And if so, let's ask what, what are the excitations of these states? So these are the typical questions one asks. One tool in cold atoms has been, uh, for many years, uh, the wonderful Feshbach resonance that allows us to tune the scattering length and uh, it actually goes through the roof once you manage to uh, bring a molecular state of the interparticle uh, potential into resonance with the energy of two free atoms. Then your scattering becomes resonant, and you can access these, uh, this interesting physics of strongly interacting uh, gases. I should say one hidden requirement here is that your gas remains stable when you do this. And this is the case for uh, a two-state mixture of fermions near resonance. Because three-body collisions, which usually make your gas uh, realize, wait a second, I want to be a solid, are suppressed. Because three fermions, when you have two spin states available, cannot come close to each other because of the Pauli principle um, prohibiting two like spins to be near each other. For bosons, the story is different, so we have to be a little bit faster in the case of unitary Bose gases that I studied, for example, in Zoran's experiment in, in Cambridge. Zoran, you might achieve, by the way, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so now let's uh, just, I, I, I like to, to demonstrate these, these interactions uh, visually. Uh, if you have a two-state mixture, blue and red, of fermions in our trap, the trap is, is uh, 
in all directions, but Z is very fluffy, elongated in this Z direction. And we just let these guys fly into each other. Nothing happens. They just fly through each other. And as you can see, they trade places. But when you have strong interactions, it is really literally strong. These gases do not penetrate, at least not easily. They much rather bounce off each other, just like two cars in a car crash. Um, and, and this is what's meant with strong interactions. That's exactly, literally, what, uh, what happens. These atoms collide at every encounter. So for the red guys to go through the blue cloud, it needs an incredible number of collisions. And it's much easier to just bounce back ballistically and uh, stay on the side where they are at. There are other types of uh, strong interactions that we can induce. You can quench the kinetic energy and promote the role of interactions. This is done in the uh, famous uh, Hubbard model, uh, where the, the only ingredient, the two ingredients are these atoms now live on the lattice. Uh, the lattice is deep, so uh, in this limit you can describe the motion as just a hopping matrix element that is allowed. And then there's an interaction if two unlike spins are on the same uh, lattice side, unlike fermions. I'm describing the Fermi Hubbard model here. Um, and these two rather simple ingredients, you, you might think, give rise to an extremely rich physics, so rich that we actually cannot calculate it on a computer. Um, and uh, that is, of course, one field, in, in, in one subfield in cold atom physics that is of, of high interest, uh, trying to see what cold atoms do in such a scenario. And then uh, uh, a third way, of, among many others, uh, uh, <coughs> to induce strong interactions is to look at uh, not point-like interactions anymore, S-wave collisions, but uh, go way beyond these S-wave collisions. And uh, one very interesting type of interaction is dipolar interactions, where these fermions have dipoles attached to them. And uh, now they can collide and either repel or attract. <coughs> the collision is long-range, and it's anisotropic. So this gives rise to a proposed wealth of states of matter uh, quantum states of matter that would be wonderful to, to see. Uh, for example, uh, you, would, uh, you might hope to see a quantum crystal, which is at the same time superfluid, but also has some crystalline order, so it's super solid, essentially, uh, induced by these dipolar interactions. Well, so this, so to speak, sets the, the stage. There are three experiments in my group, and we are, so to speak, trying to uh, investigate all these three um, ways of inducing strong interactions. And the first one is using the Feshbach resonances, the second one is from the Hubbard model using optical lattices, and the third one is diapolar interactions. Uh, the ordering got switched two days ago. Uh, I will talk about the middle part <coughs> last. Um, let's first look at the Feshbach resonance uh, picture. There um, we have this wonderful tunability of the scattering length. <coughs> We can make the scattering length weak and negative. Negative means you have weak attraction. The wave functions are ever so slightly pulled in so that the atoms actually attract uh, each other. And then we know from Barty, Cooper, and Schrieffer that the ground state should be a superfluid of very fluffy, very uh, weakly bound Cooper pairs with uh, a distance between the two uh, partners of the Cooper pair being much larger than the interparticle spacing. We can go to the other extreme, I think a positive scattering net that's sort of weak. Then you have a bound state, a molecular bound state, that these two fermions can, can uh, uh, live in. And so they will form this molecule, which is a boson. So the ground state will be a boson Einstein condensate of molecules. And in the middle, we have this uh, interesting crossover <coughs> superfluid where the pair size is on the order of the interparticle space, a very strongly directing soup <coughs> of particles where probably pair changes, uh, partner changes are ongoing all the time. We know for a while that these gases are superfluid uh, by putting them in, into rotation and seeing uh, the vortex lattices. But it turns out one embarrassing uh, thing uh, is that in these old days, we actually couldn't give a good number for the temperature of the gas because we didn't know the equation of state of the gas. It's not so easy to stick in a thermometer into this nano Kelvin cold uh, the cloud. But it is interesting to ask about this equation of state, and so I usually compare uh, our atoms to, for example, the physics in a neutron star. 
Now, I should be honest, inside a neutron star, the physics is too complicated uh, to be modeled by cold atoms, at least in this you know, a decade, I would say, um, maybe 50 years. <laughs> but uh, the crust of a neutron star, think, think about very dilute neutron matter. These are also uh, spin one half fermions, very dilute, and live at very different densities, but that's not important. What's important is the ratio of the scattering length to the interparticle spacing, and that can be uh, tuned in our experiment. So indeed, we can roughly tune to the same situation as we have in the neutron star, where the scattering length is much larger in magnitude than the interparticle spacing. That's what happens at the Feshbach resonance. So finding the equation of state in our atom gas will teach us about the equation of state of at least dilute neutron matter. And of course, there's fine prints here. We neglect the effective range. But if someone writes a computer code that gives me the equation of state of neutron stars, I would ask that person to switch off all the complications and just have the simple model spin one half with the scattering length that's uh, nearly diverging. Does that computer code give the same energy that we measure in the lab or not? Because that's what, what is necessary for me to trust the theory. So I will talk about a new uh, tool in our experiment on fermionic superfluids namely putting these fermions in a box, in a homogeneous potential, because the theorists will be very happy. Uh, no longer this uh, awkward uh, harmonic trap which creates uh, inhomogeneous potentials, but also there are certain states of matter that we will have no chance of seeing if you have inhomogeneous densities. We need to have a fixed density in our trap, then we can hope to see certain um, states of matter. So there's this wonderful uh, picture of Fermi in a box, which depicts what we're about to do. He is confused. Why do we need it? Well, uh, this is showing you the, the problem. Sometimes it is also the solution, but let me just describe it. This would be our usual trap, say harmonic or Gaussian, doesn't matter. But the, the point is that you realize different phases in this trap in, at different heights of the potential. So in the bottom, you, you be, might be very dense. And at a given temperature, that means very degenerate. You might have a superfluid, wonderful. But up there, you might be normal, uh, which density is, is uh, lower. And if you now take, a, uh, take an image and integrate over the entire density of this gas, you will just see all these phases at once <coughs> squished together. It's not so nice. Um, certain states of matter will even be completely obscured. There is. Um, there is the wonderful prediction of the fulde ferrell lakin of Chilikov state, which happens when you have more spin-ups than spin-downs. Spontaneously, the superfluid should start uh, having wonderful solitons that pop up suddenly in the middle of the gas, and you fill these solitons with excess fermions. It's a beautiful state, has never been seen. Oh, I'm not getting killed right now by some someone who did, but like, okay, uh, I don't think that's been uh, seen in the way that we want to see it, namely that the order parameter really oscillates in space. Uh, why? Because you need, well, in cold atoms, the, the big why is because you need a very particular density imbalance to realize this state. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So you shouldn't do it in a harmonic track. You should do it in a box. Uh, other reasons are, of course, if you have a response you're studying at the, uh, the, the response of the gas towards a, a probe, a global probe like microwave spectroscopy, radio frequency spectroscopy, the response will be completely blurred. So this will not happen in, in a box. There are, uh, 20 years after BEC, now there are box potentials around. It took actually a while, and uh, Zoran here in, the, uh, in, in front uh, provided us with a first <coughs> box and taught us how to do it. Um, it's really a box. It's literally a, a, a box. You have to provide uh, confinement to your atoms uh, by using, for example, repulsive sheets of light that act literally form a box potential so that the atoms live most of the time in the dark and only when they meet the, the walls, they are repelled from the walls, just literally like a box. Um, and another box for uh, studies of 2D physics uh, exists in, in, in Paris. You immediately see how, how wonderful it is for uh, uh, measurements uh, when we take our usual line of sight integrated uh, images, where we take the laser beam and let it be absorbed by the gas and 
image the shadow on the CCD camera, the integral will no longer integrate over uh, unequal densities, but all the densities are the same. So you simply get uh, L, the length of the box, which you can measure, times the density of, uh, of the gas uh, in the XY plane, and, and immediately have access to the, to the density itself, and not some integrated density. How do we make it? Well, uh, we have optical uh, ways to make this uh, box potential. Turns out we like to use an hexagon to give us these beautiful ring-shaped um, uh, light profiles. Now you see there are some corrugations in this ring, which is in principle already kind of a nice step, but you want to get rid of this inner uh, stuff there, uh, and so you combine it with, a, with an opaque mask. So the mask together with this ring of light provides a very nice box for your atoms, and it simply works. Um, this is a, a fancy 3D version of it. This is the ring of light. And these are two end caps, which are actually not as perfect as shown here. These are, uh, these are themselves laser beams uh, that, um, uh, that are masked off so that we get this shadow region in between here. So we have a cylinder with end caps, essentially. That's what it is. There is a weak uh, magnetic field curvature across the cloud, which will come into play later, but inside this box region, it is negligible compared to the Fermi energy. So the, the variation in potential energy is negligible compared to the Fermi energy of our gas. Well, that's the box. These are Fermi's in the box. Um, that's what it is. That's what a box should look like. Here you have the uh, uh, view along this beautiful circle of light. It's simply uh, a box. I cannot stretch that more. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a pretty good box. We can ask, you know, how sharp is it? Does it go like R to infinity in terms of the radial potential, which would be a true box potential? No, it goes like R to the 16 or so, which for all purposes is enough for us to, to call it a box. Are we cold in there? Yes, we can condense, which we noted by just tracking the uh, condensation in this trap usually using usual typical techniques, which are a little bit, you know, takes a while to explain, but these pictures show you there's a condensate forming in the center, uh, which in fact has the size of the box, pretty much doesn't expand, whereas the thermal cloud here still expands from the, from the box. So we know we have a condensate in there of pairs, and we see vortices, uh, quite often actually, <laughs> because of the loading procedure, we are not creating the most, uh, uh, the, the, uh, in the early times, we were not creating the most, uh, um, what is quiet superfluid. It actually is a little bit wiggly, and usually, uh, often, one vortex survives even after long times, and we see that. It's kind of cute, because that immediately tells us, okay, wow, this is actually pretty cool. Now, uh, I said, like, let's, let's play with this, gray, with this curvature. Uh, in fact, let's tear down these two walls. Um, that is giving us, um, I would say, the best of both worlds. Uh, we have a homogeneous potential in the radial direction, but axially, let me call that axially, uh, we have still a wonderful magnetic harmonic potential. We can measure the traffic frequency to easily uh, four digits, and, and uh, that provides us a wonderful uh, calibrated scan through the, uh, uh, of the chemical potential of the gas. I say it's the best of both worlds because now in one shot we get the density as a function of potential. Not some integrated density that we have to deconvolve with complicated algorithms as we used to a few years ago, but just the density as a function of potential. This is how a raw image looks like. Um, when you uh, looking from, say, top in the previous image. Uh, that means this radial direction here is the one where we have uh, this, this uh, circle, so to speak, at each slice it's a circle of fermions. We can, we, and we know that uh, the size of that disk and can divide by it. And then you see this beautiful, these beautiful straight equidensity lines, um, which tell you, okay, so along Z, this is the Z direction, we are scanning through the phase diagram, we are changing the density, but along R, there is no such change. So it's, it's rather beautiful. We can evaporate in this trap, and for the, you know, 
experimentalists, experts in the, in the audience, this is kind of cute to see. You're uh, getting, uh, you're, you're cutting into the cloud, getting colder, or at least lose, lose the atoms, but the, ch the shape changes completely because radially, of course, the size doesn't change pretty much. Axially, of course, you shrink because of this harmonic confinement of the sea. These are the profiles that we obtain. And uh, looks like a small detail, but so number one, <laughs> I should say the big feature here is simply beautifully fit by saying this is a homogeneous Fermi gas where I slowly tune my chemical potential. Because it goes like the density really goes like the chemical potential to the three halves power. That's the equation of state for a Fermi gas. You should note this is actually a unitary Fermi gas, a very strongly electric Fermi gas, which, however, has the same uh, equation of state. Density is proportional to the chemical potential to the three half power. The size is given by this uh, the, the energy of this unitary Fermi gas, which is itself very interesting. But you also see these little lips here. Those are the thermal wings of your uh, of your superfluid. In fact, you see sort of a kink here. That kink has never been seen, uh, at least with this signal to noise, in, in one shot of the experiment uh, experiments done in, uh, in, in harmonic traps. Uh, here, however, we really see the density and not some integrated density. So this kink really just pops up and, and is, is very obvious to the, to the eye. Um, now, this can be used, actually, to measure the equation of state. That's an old slide that I used to explain our old method, which works for the new method as well. <laughs> Just saying, now I use the fact that the density is tuned through the potential, and I can extract locally what is the local compressibility, the local pressure, the local density. And uh, just like some climber that's climbing up a hill to measure the, that the density actually gets thinner as a function of height, we get the equation of state by measuring the density as a function of potential in our trap. So this is the uh, data from yesterday, <laughs> which is, uh, to me, was just wonderful to see this, that this new tool gives us an equation of state in really just an, uh, a couple of shots. Okay, it's like, I think it's 50. <laughs> Still, but it, it's, it's a very precise uh, a measurement with error bars. And you see the sudden rise and fall in the compressibility of the gas at a certain critical pressure that signals the superfluid transition. I'm showing you here the result from 2012. This is the result from yesterday uh, in, in our hybrid strap. It works beautifully. Uh, just to say that we will not stop there, uh, but also we have uh, other cute things that we can do. For example, radio frequency spectroscopy to measure the local response of the gas to a radio frequency pulse. Radio frequency is able to break fermion pairs. In fact, you can go from, say, uh, this, uh, you have to spin up and spin down mixture. They are paired up. And now you can drive the transition from spin up to some other third empty state. Because we have more than two spin states available, other than with electrons. And uh, usually that energy difference is perfectly known. It's how our atomic clocks work. But in the presence of strong interactions, this energy is going to be shifted, for example, by molecular binding. And then we will see a shift in the resonance frequency and uh, some long tail, which is itself interesting. Here you see there's a shift because zero is not <coughs> quite where you see the peak. And, and here comes again the power of this hybrid trap, because in one scan of the right radio frequency, we see how we can actually transfer different parts of the cloud that exist at different densities, showing you in one uh, scan that indeed the gas has a local uh, response that depends on uh, the, the local density. Non-tracting gas will, of course, not do that. This is purely due to interactions and allows us to very precisely measure these uh, binding energies and also short-range correlations that we can see from the in, in the tails. I have no time to tell you the whole story about how to analyze these pictures, these these our frequencies. I just wanted to um, feature this this new tool and just deliver my excitement. Uh, the pictures uh, are I, I find breathtaking um, and give spectra of really unprecedented quality. Um, so now I want to. 
switch gears to the molecule side of the of the story, where we have created uh, an ultra good gas of chemically stable fermions. So uh, the the choice of the molecule is sodium potassium. It's driven by <coughs> precisely this chemical stability. If NaK meets another NaK, it cannot undergo a chemical reaction to form Na2 plus K2. It's simply energetically forbidden. That's the lack of nature. Um, turns out, in the first experiments providing us with ultra-cold fermion molecules, KRB plus KRB, that did undergo a chemical reaction to K2 and RB2. And um, uh, NaK does not um, have that uh, chemical instability. Uh, the dipole moment that you can achieve with this molecule is very healthy. It's 2.7 dBi at maximum, uh, which would give you a very strong dipolar interaction energy. An energy, again, on the order of the Fermi energy, or in terms of length scales, you can also say there's a dipolar length scale associated to this interaction energy on the order of the <coughs> particle's distance, again. So instead of the scattering length being on the order of the interparticle distance, the dipolar length can be on the interparticle on the order of the interparticle distance. It's again a strongly interacting gas. The way to make these uh, molecules uh, uh, is known since, since a long time and demonstrated uh, for the first time in 2008 by Kankuen, for example, over here. And uh, the Innsbruck group in, uh, with cesium-2. Uh, and the, the trick is you take a cold gas, in our case potassium and sodium, <coughs> glue them together using the Feshbach resonance, but that gives you very fluffy, vibration excited molecules, and then you glue them together into a tightly bound molecule using a two photon transition, which bridges an incredible amount of energy, 7,500 Kelvin, without the injection of any heat. It's, it's a rather uh, amazing, mind boggling um, story that this is actually possible. We have formed these mixtures, uh, the Feshbach molecules, and um, and uh, not so long ago, these ground state uh, molecules and um, are now having fun studying these, uh, these fermions in our trap. Um, this would be the, uh, the diagram to have in mind, how, how this transfer works. We have um, the, the ground state potential, where here is the absolute ground state of the sodium potassium molecule. That's where we want to be. We start out here in this very weakly long-range molecule, um, which is the Feshbach molecule. It's essentially two atoms on a stick. That's how large it is. See, most of its wave function is it's not even shown. It's up here. <laughs> um, but then there is intermediate state, which actually has wave function overlap with the initial state and the final state. And the two photon transition drives us down into the ground state. I will spare you the story of the spectroscopy. Uh, which was actually quite complicated for sodium potassium. <coughs> you need very special states to work with. Those that actually mix the singlet and, and triplet, electron triplet states. But we found those magic states. There was a coupling which allowed us beautiful coupling um, of this intermediate state with both the Feshbach molecular state and the absolute ground state. And uh, <coughs> this picture for the experts shows that it works. <laughs> Uh, usually, if you shine in your red laser and you're resonant with one of these excited state transitions, then you see this loss curve. But if you also have this coupling laser on, the blue one, uh, and you find the exact resonance that gets you into the ground state, then there's this beautiful protection window opening up. This is simply EIT um, that, that you know from, from uh, Lisha's experiments for, for many years. Uh, as a byproduct, we know now the ground state energy uh, of NAK to uh, an astonishing number of digits. Um, I hope that's useful to someone. <laughs> For us, it's actually it's, it's necessary to, to know that, of course, to even be able to do these things. This is showing just that the stirrup works, the stirrup stimulated rapid adiabatic passage, where we uh, switch on these laser intensities in a People say counterintuitive succession. Once you start thinking about it for a long time, it starts to become intuitive, so I don't know how to call it now. But uh, uh, it is providing us the coupling of the Feshbach molecules into the ground state molecules and back, if you want, uh, with 75% uh, efficiency. Maybe by now we have like 80%. Um, 
he is or so on. It could be any five, but um, that's roughly uh, what, what uh, apply the electric field and follow the uh, resonance to see what, what the uh, dipole moment actually is. And we can uh, go easily up to 0.8 dBi uh, um, and with current uh, house price electrodes. Uh, that corresponds to a dipole length which is 600 nanometers. That is really uh, very comparable to the typical interparticle spacing in these, um, in these gases. So that actually uh, would provide us with a very gas with strong dipole interactions. Uh, the hyperfine structure is unfortunately something you have to learn about once you work with these molecules. Uh, in the ground state, it's not even so bad. I call this not so bad. It only has 36 states. Uh, that's coming from the sodium and the potassium nuclear spin, three halves and four, which gives you 36 states to play with. We like to be down here in the absolute ground state, uh, and, and then you, you count through the uh, possible alignments of the potassium nuclear spin, gives you a um, total of nine states, and times four possible alignments of the sodium nuclear spin, and that's how they uh, orient. The first interesting thing to ask is, is this system stable? Is it stable in the ground state? Is it stable maybe also in excited hyperfine states? And um, that is the case, so it's, I, I would call it rather stable. We have several seconds lifetimes of the molecules in the lowest hyperfine state, and pretty much the same lifetime in excited hyperfine states. So that's maybe not so confusing, so, so surprising, because uh, hyperfine relaxation should be very, very small in these um, nuclear spin uh, molecules. Uh, what about other types of uh, interactions that could mess you up, so to speak, uh, or, or, or give you trouble or come into play? Um, <coughs> let's think about the Van der Waals interaction between each, the two of these molecules. First of all, for alkali atoms, just to get a sense of scale, I know that um, the Van der Waals interaction is driven by virtual transitions to the electronically excited states, so from S to P, which has a distance on the order of a few atomic units, 6% um, uh, of, of the atomic units. So atomic units would be hard trace, so it's of course quite a bit less, but okay, few percent of, of that. The dipole moment, the transition dipole moment to go from S to P is also going to be some atomic units, so then the Van der Waals interaction, well, if you uh, uh, plug it in, you will get a few thousand atomic units. Uh, for molecules, you might think it's the same thing, because uh, although the electronic excited states are quite a bit more complicated, it's a whole zoo, if you average over all of them, you should also get uh, kind of the same uh, few percent of atomic units splittings here, and that should still give you on the order of thousand atomic units. Turns out, uh, one should also think about virtual rotational excitations of these molecules, from J equals 0 to J equals 1. That would be the dominant, uh, by far the dominant one. Uh, that uh, energy difference is tiny. It's a few bigger, so 10 to minus 6 atomic units. The dipole moment is still strong. It's still on the order of an atomic dipole moment because it's done by the electrons <coughs> in the molecule. Uh, so this will give you, if you plug things in, 500,000 atomic units for sodium potassium. Turns out, because of the smaller dipole moment, for rubidium potassium, you get only the standard, so to speak, C6 coefficient for sodium potassium is stronger. So why is that important? Well, because we can ask, what if we had chemical reactions? These guys would see each other with a certain probability, which we can calculate, um, so at low temperatures, the, the only way spin polarized molecules can meet is via P-wave collisions, which we have this huge P-wave barrier. It's actually not terribly huge, it's 12 microkelvin, but we live at like 500 nanokelvin or so. And you can ask, um, what is the typical rate at which these uh, particles would tunnel through this barrier? And if they tunnel through the barrier and we had a chemical reaction, um, uh, we, would, we would get a certain loss rate. And that loss rate is, uh, 400 milliseconds or so if you plug in our densities and temperatures, whereas we have many seconds lifetime. So we uh, see an indication that we have really enhanced stability uh, precisely because we are not chemically reactive. So, sorry, can you repeat the sentence you just said? 
we have uh, 400 milliseconds is kind of the predicted uh, decay rate if yeah. you assume chemical reactions. So you, uh, when you yeah. tunnel through the barrier, you say you have 100% loss. So that means that death, the rate of death is given by how frequently you tunnel. And that you can calculate from the densities and temperatures that we have. And you have lifetimes that are what? Many seconds. So, but that's also telling you then, not just about the, any kind of chemical process, but any loss yes. process. Yes. So if, uh, if you keep using that model, it would pro you, you could say, you could, you could sort of say, there is not 100% death rate, but maybe 10% death rate. So that's that, that basically on those that that's ratios roughly. about where you're, where you're at? Okay. 10%, yes. Okay. Where does the loss come from? It's chemical stable, and the loss comes from the fact that it's going to be you know, activated faster? I believe it is inelastic three-body losses. Mm -hmm. And I have indication for that because uh, this is actually a cute story. So, so spin polarized fermions, they are protected by P-wave collisions from coming near each other. But of course, when they tunnel through, then uh, you, you can have a loss if three guys come and then they form Two, two of them form a, a cluster, like tetrame or something, and uh, a third, the third guy runs away with some energy and momentum. That would be the loss <coughs> process. But uh, what about if you have a two-state mixture, two different hyperfine states, 50-50? Now you actually have strong elastic collisions, because now you have S-wave collisions allowed. But you still have protection from P-wave uh, collisions, because you have only two spin states available, and you want to have three guys come together to form an inelastic uh, loss process. So that's still P wave suppressed. And we, uh, we see, I will show some quick slide, uh, th that we actually have this strong um, P wave like suppression of these, S these collisions of the two state mixture as well. Whereas a three state mixture, data is not as awesome, but it looks like it just dies much faster on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Yeah. When you say three body, yes. You mean three molecules? Three molecules, but yes. three molecules that approach each other at the same time. Yes. There's also the uh, possibility where you have two molecules approach each other, and they last long enough in that in kind of a resonance or you know some kind of multi-body bound state for the third body to come along. That's kind of what I was trying to get at. Good. If you're actually you, you, yes. you can put, put a bound on that process, right? Yes. Yes. So those would be the so-called sticky collisions, right? When uh, Two guys come together to spend a long time, and the third guy uh, 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 comes along. Uh, one could probably still call it, I mean, it's still a three body collision. It's just with a long time delay in between the first encounter of two guys right. and then the third guy. Right. Right. So, what, so, is that, for example, the centrifugal barrier, does it actually allow the shape that does perform between the barrier or not? Like for example, if it's 12 Kelvin. Yeah, yeah. The there are, there could be uh, lots of states there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so that, that allows us to keep there, there, there are lots of states. Uh, you can just estimate it from the C6 coefficient, actually. Uh, that, because you can know that, and then you can, you can see what's the typical energy scale of, say, the next molecular state, which be, would be given by h bar squared over the uh, mass over the van der Waals radius squared, and that gives you only. Uh, 50 micro Kelvin, or, or 50, sorry, uh, I have to be careful. Okay, it's actually, it could be on the order of one, <laughs> of one uh, state in, in uh, between zero and, and, and high up there. We, are, we live, though, at uh, near zero energy, 500 nano Kelvin, so we'd be kind of unlucky if that shape resonance was right there. Maybe we could tune it and, and get some sort of resonance. Yeah, yeah. We actually looked for that, didn't see a resonance. But uh, we should probably do finer steps, and you know, maybe it's very very narrow. When you have these underground forces, which we have so strong because the energy is very small, could it happen that the regulator originally used the standard I don't think so, because actually, honestly, it must be even, I, in my mind, it's even better than for C6, because the Van der Waals range, 400 A0, also roughly tells you 
roughly you know, where this p-wave barrier is. It's, it's far out there, much further than for atoms, which is 40 a naught. So, so it seems that they have an even harder time entering the complicated region uh, inside the, the barrier than, than atoms. Yes, as long as long as it's a Just the fact that this number is large in units that we use, atomic units, doesn't tell me that, that it necessarily is, is dangerous <laughs> of, of, of the theory. So, so now we can actually, uh, I, I will switch to a coherent control story of the internal states of these NAK molecules, which of course allow us hopefully to learn something about these collisions uh, eventually. Uh, let's see, uh, what can we do with these uh, molecules? is of course a 60, 70, 80 year old story um, where uh, you can drive, for example, rotational transitions from J equals 0 to J equals 1. You might say like, okay, there are three possible transitions um, according to the three different alignments of the uh, rotational wave function of the molecule. Turns out there are more because you have coupling between the nuclear spin and, and rotation. Um, and, and so it's, it's a little bit, you know, mess, but it's fine. There are also these transitions here, where um, you uh, do a transition that seems not allowed, where uh, you start with, um, oh, sorry, you start with this guy uh, in, in the ground state, the certain nuclear uh, alignment, and you go to a superposition state of uh, two different alignments of the nuclear wave function, one and zero, and. Uh, that superposition state is the eigenstate because of this coupling between nuclear spin and rotation. And so that allows you actually a handle to get your ground state through a two photon transition into another ground state with, with a slightly different nuclear spin alignment. So uh, this is very useful actually. We will drive in, in a few slides this two photon transition directly to initialize the hyperfine superposition. We first just show we can drive coherent Rabi oscillations of the entire molecular sample. Um, I, I should stress that because usually you, you can do this with, with your molecules uh, if, if you project out, so to speak, of your big gas um, a, a certain subclass of molecules that happen to be in the right state, and then you, you see these Rabi oscillations on that. But here we do the Rabi oscillations of the entire chapter sample. Uh, same with this spin flip transition, as I, I, I could call it, where you uh, go from a predominantly three half nuclear state to, to, to a different nuclear state, one one half, which seems uh, not allowed, but it is allowed because of uh, this strong mixing in the excited state of the nuclear spin and the rotation. So all these things are, are possible, uh, have been de demonstrated uh, much earlier, of course, for KRB. It just works the same way for NAK. Uh, now we can use uh, this, uh, this handle on the molecules uh, in order to produce a hyperfine superposition of the lowest two uh, states. And then initialize with our two photon pulse a Ramsey sequence. So spin up and spin down on my block sphere are now two nuclear uh, alignments of the molecule in the J equals zero ground state. That's actually pretty nice. It's a pretty okay clock. It only has nuclear magnetic moments because we are in a singlet molecule, so the electron spin is completely shielded. Um, only nuclear spins. It's fermion, so so most of the interactions are so the interactions are protected by P wave uh, by this P wave barrier. So it's probably a pretty good clock. And of course, I, I say this because I know it's pretty good. <laughs> Honestly, it was, uh, it was surprising how how good it was. This simply shows the coherent two photon transition connecting us between the minus four. Uh, nuclear spin alignment, of minus 4 is the, the, the potassium nuclear spin. Potassium nuclear spin is 4, so m, m potassium is minus 4 to minus 3. Uh, it's not a very interesting clock because the energy difference is 21 kilohertz, okay. But uh, it is nevertheless uh, uh, as interesting to us to measure, for example, interesting, um, very faint interaction shifts in this transition. Um, 
because that only depends on how precisely we can measure this 21 kilohertz. Uh, it turns out we can measure it really precisely. This shows the Renzi uh, uh, revivals up and down, up and down, uh, as a function of time, which actually works for uh, hundreds of milliseconds. This is the, the whole plot and, and the fit that goes actually through the data. Uh, it's actually not doing a great job because it's actually an exponential envelope, and I don't think it, it, it should be if we, if we are careful to, uh, if, you, if you look carefully. But we get a coherence time of 400 milliseconds for this uh, nuclear spin uh, combination. So it's a rather healthy uh, coherence time, which allows us to measure uh, clock shifts, density dependent shifts, that are hopefully due to interesting interactions, to uh, the Hertz fish level. Here's the same story in frequency space. You know, you can either vary time in a Ramsey sequence, or you fix the time and vary frequency, and uh, you get beautiful uh, Ramsey fringes, um, which allow you easily to detect uh, a fraction of uh, 10, 10 hertz here, like so on the order of a few hertz um, precision. We could, we could, we could make it even better. Um, this is a complicated slide that uh, I didn't really want to talk about, but like you asked the question, this is just I'll translate the slide for you. It simply says like all these long times, they go down as you increase both the density and the temperature of the of the gas. We interpret this so far uh, as an, um, a loss of this P wave barrier, well, loss of P protection through P wave. Uh, well, or I shouldn't call it loss of protection because we are still, the temperature is still much lower than the barrier, but of course it's an activation of that process, right? Uh, the, the P wave strength scales with temperature and density. So uh, that, that's what we uh, think it is. Uh, in fact, uh, the fact that even the coherence time, which is shown here in this tiny inset that is so tiny they cannot see it, the coherence time goes down with density and temperature, tells us that this dephasing that we are seeing is not due to magnetic field noise in the lab, which could have been the case, I don't want to say, if no new metal shielding anything, but it is due to uh, interactions of the molecules. Ten to the eleven, one ish times ten to the eleven. So how is it related to the lifetime? So the the, the lifetime is uh, five times longer than the coherence time, roughly. So more, pretty much, yeah. It, it, it's you can roughly. <coughs> sorry, if you had a you know microscope, uh, you could you could look at it. Uh, the, the the tiny dots, open dots down here, that's the coherence time, which I needed to blow up to make it visible. It's uh, on the order of you know, 400 milliseconds and then going down. The uh, lifetime starts with four seconds, a large error bar, going down um, pretty much you know, in proportion to the coherence time. So uh, it's probably the same thing that kills coherence and uh, causes loss. And it makes total sense. Once they collide, it resets the clock, but it also actually causes the, some, some loss. Um, but uh, here's a cute thing hidden hidden in this graph, the fact that we see a lifetime, even of the decohered mixture, much of, of several seconds, means that the two-state mixture of two different nuclear spins lives. <coughs> so we have the same beautiful situation as in lithium, where a two-state mixture of lithium atoms lives, because three-body collisions are suppressed, because the third guy has to have either up or down spin, and that's suppressed by P-wave. So that's wonderful, because it means we can hopefully study even S-wave interactions in this water current gas, and, and it will be fine. Yeah. Um, is it clear how to distinguish the effective uh, light shifts on the, on the rate of equivalent? Beautiful question. There are no light shifts in J equals 0, because in J equals 0, it looks like it's brown. <laughs> in J equals 1, there are light shifts. So actually, a superposition of J equals 0 and J equals 1, I didn't show it, it lasts for like a few milliseconds so like oh, this. So on, on a J equals 0 transition. But this is J equals 0 to J equals 0, two photon transition, and is therefore insensitive to, to light shifts. Yeah, that's actually very crucial. I'm kind of hoping that maybe if we go to another vibrational state, and it's J equals 0 state, this suddenly could become a very interesting clock, if it works and it's still stable at all. Right, because suddenly you have huge energy differences. 
was immediately telling them that they had fermions which were avoiding each other and they were forming a band insulator in this optical lattice. This was a single spin state of fermions and they could not sit on top of each other due to the Pauli principle. And that gives you this beautiful, uh, dense, uh, flat packing. Uh, if you have two spin states, then you are immediately in the Fermi Hubbard model. And again, calls to Newcastle, uh, you have two things that matter the hopping rate and the repulsion in a lattice. And you can form various states that are interesting. Uh, for example, this shows a metallic uh, situation where you have still holes, you can still move around, so you can conduct. This is the model insulating phase, uh, which um, has unity filling of fermions, but, but we could say half integer filling per spin state. So all the lattice sites are occupied, but you don't know necessarily whether it's a blue guy or a red guy. And you cannot tunnel to the next site if you're this guy, because you have to pay the interaction energy U. And then the band insulator still exists, but now with two atoms per site, because you have uh, uh, two colors available. And then tunneling is suppressed by Pauli. The same thing in the trap is of course against scanning through this phase diagram. Um, precisely because of the same reason that we had before. In the center where you're very dense, you, you can have the situation that you have a band insulator, over here the mock insulator, and then further out the final temperature you could have some metal. Or in between these phases you also could have a metal. So now here is after uh, uh, a year of uh, a heroic effort of, of the guys, uh, I mean, I cannot explain. I mean, this is like brings tears to my eyes. Uh, these uh, these pictures where you cool uh, this disordered gas into uh, a mock insulating uh, phase, and uh, you can have so, so you actually make exactly <laughs> this picture that I was alluding to with this trap picture. You have things like this where in the center you have a band insulator. Why do I know this? But if I see nothing, nothing means either zero or two, because our imaging kills sites where we have two atoms per site. Same, same as Marcus' experiment. So if you have in the center of this region that is, that is dark, then you know, oh, that's a bad insulator. Outside you have, well, kind of a hot-ish uh, metal could be turning into a moth insulator. Uh, at low temperatures, you have a beautiful moth insulator. Um, a little bit of tweaking gives you then these images where you start with a pretty perfect moth insulator, um, which you can also see in the density profile. It's pretty much unity filled. And then a sharp drop, telling you that we are quite low temperatures. Then in the middle you get some holes as you squeeze. What are these holes? These are not actually losses. We are squeezing. And we are squeezing the fermions on top of each other, overcoming you. <coughs> and we get a band insulator in the center, surrounded by uh, still a healthy-ish hot uh, <coughs> insulator. Last slide would be, let's analyze what temperatures we can get. Uh, here you see the density versus radius for one of these images compared to a very simple uh, uh, atomic limit partition function, so not yet including tunneling. Actually, it's uh, difficult to do that because the temperature is quite low, uh, quite similar to the tunneling. So series expansions don't work well. Um, we find um, uh, rather low temperature, to, temperatures on the order of the tunneling, but well, that's not low to maybe, you know, well, you know, the theorists would love to see, but it's, it's low for, for the charge sector, say. Um, the temperature is, the absolute temperature to me is also pretty mind boggling in these lattices, 5 nanokelvin. And the entropy is, uh, locally, it can be as low as 0.73, and I remind you that log 2 is 0.7-ish. Um, so we, we see that we have removed essentially all the charge entropy, all the entropy in the uh, density of this uh, two-state mixture of fermions, and now the remaining entropy is just in the fact that we don't know where is the blue guy, where is the red guy. Who knows, maybe they're already ordered. <laughs> Probably not, but like, that's, that's of course the next goal to try to spin resolve these things. So this gets me to the, to the outlook. Uh, we are after interesting new states of matter that are uh, difficult to see or have not been seen. For example, this fully real state I talked about. Uh, interesting state of dipolar fermions and um, uh, hopefully elucidating details about the Fermi Hubbard model where um, uh, theories have a hard time 
uh, understanding exactly what is what is going on, and we can really uh, look at our quantum gas and, and ask nature, so to speak, how nature solves the sign problem that you have with proteins. Okay, with that, I, I want to thank my uh, um, my labs, and and you saw I could not keep I could not pick. I had to tell you stuff from all the three labs because I was just so happy. So thanks for your attention. This reminds me a lot of uh, Jungi's experiments on strontium. Uh, also, a wonderful clock, fermions, and weak interactions, all, also P wave dominated. And uh, in their case, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, dephasing was clearly not exponential at all. It actually was uh, uh, coming from um, the different interactions that they had in their different pancakes uh, over which they integrated far from exponential. Here we have just one sample in a bulk trap, but probably it's also not exponential. <laughs> so maybe it's interesting also to try something like spin echoes. Yes. Which is what you were saturating, right? Yes. Do they come back or, or, or not? Yes. Uh, one question also concerning that. Do you see uh, density dependence of the Rabi frequency, <coughs> that the renormalization of the Rabi frequency due to its actions, which could give you a, a handle on the quasi particle weight of your fermions, let's assume it's a fermi liquid? Uh, no. <laughs> we, of course, we haven't looked carefully at that. The first thing that we want to look at, which is, I think, easier to see, is actually shift in the uh, frequency itself due to density. density yeah. and, and we have uh, actually indications Yes, I shouldn't say that. Who knows whether it will hold up? That there are densely dependent shifts in this frequency. It's easier to measure this. This Rabi frequency itself could depend on like our cables shaking in the air. That's a, of course an interesting suggestion. Um, what is just roughly the energy scale for the interactions? Good question. <laughs> so. Uh, we don't know, but we know the van der Waals, uh, uh, you know, C6, so we can uh, say what's the most probable scattering length, say between spin up and spin down. Um, that would be 400 A0, which we actually kind of, kind of healthy, kind of large. <coughs> and that would uh, translate, uh, you know, I think it's tens of hertz-ish um, uh, interaction scales. <coughs> but uh, note that in the RAM scene, frequency and the density dependent shift, you're sensitive not to the absolute in interaction, but the difference in the interaction between the, the spin down and the spin up state. And if they have very similar interactions, we will have a hard time actually seeing it. But if there's a slight difference, we might have a chance. That's, that was the case in strontium, uh, in this incredibly accurate clock. Uh, they did see Hertz level shifts coming from the density difference, from the difference in the interaction between two hyperparticles, so not two hyperparticles, between their true states. Yeah, I